us. Let us pray together. Lord, as we, we come to your word this morning, Lord, we, we ask that you would, that you would anoint this uh, with your, your Holy Spirit. Lord, that we would, we would hear what, you, what you're telling us. We would hear what your word has to say. We would understand its authority for how we live our lives in relationship with you. Lord, as we, as we look at this, give us your grace that, that this, would, this would enter into our minds, that we could think about this, that we could use our reason and our intelligence, but that it moves from our minds, from our heads to our hearts. Lord, that we would live out your word. Lord, as we, as we think about these things, as we hear your message from your word for us, Lord, we pray that, that, you, would, that you would use this cracked and broken vessel that you would work through the ineptitude of, of your servant and that you would give your message to your people, your word to your flock. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to take a look at this um, from Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 12. As we, as we look at this, uh, I'm going to, uh, I want to talk about, about this, whole, uh, this whole idea as, as one, one continuous idea. Oftentimes we take this in, in, in pieces about judging others, about profaning the holy, about ask, search, and knock. But, and, and then we have the golden rule. How many of you ever heard of the golden rule? How many of you all practice the golden rule? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. And, but, so we, we take all these things separately, but really, in, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus puts these things together, and there is a reason for, for what he's saying, from what he's taught to where we get to here uh, in the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. The scriptures just before the scripture that we're looking, uh, looking at today, Jesus is telling us not to worry. In fact, the last part of chapter 6 says, So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worry worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. Well, what are today's troubles? If I'm not going to worry about tomorrow, then, then uh, okay, I won't worry about tomorrow, but Jesus says, today brings some troubles. So, so what are those troubles? And I believe that Jesus tells us what they are, how to look out for them, and how to move through them from the lens of the Sermon on the Mount, from the lens of, the, of or through the lens of the, of the Beatitudes, through the lens of relationship, which, which he has talked about here. Uh, how, how is it, what is it that we deal with today? The Sermon on the Mount is, again, all about relationship. And, and this section is no different in that it tells us how we are in relationship today with each other as kingdom people. In other words, as Christians, how do we relate to each other? It tells us how do we how we rate, relate with people who are non-believers, non-Christians, people who don't believe in Jesus. Uh, it tells us finally how we are to relate with God in a continuing relationship. So Jesus begins with how we as believers relate to one another. And let me read that for you at uh, verses one through five. Do not judge so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you, may, uh, you make, you will be judged, and the measure you give will be the measure that you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me, make the, let me take the speck out of your eye while the log is in your, in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. How many times we take this this scripture and we and we it's all we think well it's all about judgment I won't judge you and you won't judge me and we'll all be good to go and we'll just love each other and and, and there'll be no judgment or any of those things when the reality is this scripture is not necessarily about judgment it's about relationship. These words that, that, are, that are used here are very specific. In, in different versions, you, you have different ways that the Greek is translated. But, but the overall understanding here is that Jesus is talking to a group of believers. In other words, he's saying, you who believe, you who are the body of Christ, this is something that you have to understand. And then he uses these, these words that are translated for us, uh, judge and judgment. The, the sense in which these Greek words are, are used are, are interesting because they're not used in the same sense. 
when we find here that it says, do not judge so that you may not be judged, the, the, the word judge is in two different senses. The first sense, you uh, do not judge, is, is an idea of not being, not, not so much as a, 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 a like passing judgment like a, a judge would do. It is the idea of being critical, of being self-righteous. So we could really correctly translate that sense of that word, that Greek word, to say, do not be critical, do not be self-righteous in your criticism of one another. The second part of that, so that you may not be judged, places the, the again, a, a, a different sense of the word in which it is, it is a, a passing of judgment, like a judge might pass down on someone. So it, what, what this is beginning to say is that, that don't be self-righteous and don't be critical with each other because there is going to be a judgment by God in that situation. So... People who are believers, when, you're, when you are, 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 uh, uh, are together, don't be critical of one another. Don't be self-righteous with one another. Because then you will be judged by God. God will pass judgment on that. And His judgment will mirror your activities. And that's pretty, that's pretty interesting to me. Because this idea is all about relationships, both as believers and our relationship with God. How does that look? I mean, that's easy for me to say, the Greek words in their senses, they blah, 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 blah yada, 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 don't be critical. How, what does that look like? Let me give you an example. My son is not going to like this. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> The other day, my kids, they get up in the morning and they know they got to brush their teeth, right? Uh, so they get up and, they're, and they're, they know they have to brush their teeth. And, and my daughter gets up and she goes and she brushes her teeth dutifully, which is wonderful. She brushes her teeth, she comes in, she sits down, and she starts eating breakfast. And my son looks at her and he, he, he says, wait a second, you can't do that. You're supposed to brush your teeth after you eat. And he goes into this whole diatribe of how she's got it all backwards. And you got to brush your teeth, or you got to eat breakfast, and you got to go brush your teeth. Because if you don't do it, then it's, you know, your teeth are going to be all nasty, yada, yada, yada. And finally I said, Riley, you brushed your teeth yet? No. <laughs> so while he was giving her uh, a lecture on how to brush your teeth correctly and when to brush and how not to brush and all these other things, the reality is that, that he hadn't even brushed his teeth yet. He was trying to pick the sawdust out of his sister's eye when he had a plank in his own. <laughs> It's the same thing. It's, it's the idea about relationship. Um, this is a call for Christians to pursue and develop and mature in their own relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and this is evident in this, in this scripture when it says, uh, Jesus says, you know, you got to work on your own plank. Before you're critical of everybody else, before you pass judgment on everybody else, before you self-righteously say, hey, you're not a good Christian, or you need to do this, or you have to do that, or, 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 or this isn't the way you're supposed to live your life as a Christian, before you do that, you better take a good long look at your own life. You better develop your relationship with Jesus Christ in your own life. So that before you give your, your sister a lecture on when and how she brushes her teeth, your teeth better have been brushed. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's about developing and nurturing our own relationships. It's not about whether it's okay to judge others. Because that opens the floodgate to something called relativism. It opens the floodgate to, to this idea, and, and I think that sometimes this idea is pervasive in the church in which, in which we say, okay, you know what, I'm not supposed to judge, the Bible says I shouldn't judge, so, so here's what I'm going to do. You do what you want to do, and I'll do what I want to do, and if it's okay with you, then it'll be okay with you, and if I do what it's okay with me, it'll be okay with me, but you don't tell me what to do, and I won't tell you what to do. 
And then that's problematic, isn't it? And I'll tell you why it's problematic. It's problematic because we have this other little part of this verse that in, in this little section that I read. It says, uh, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye. Now here it is. And then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Do you see this? It doesn't say, this isn't an idea. We can't, we can't pass any kind of moral judgments. We can't have some kind of doctrine. We can't have some kind of orthodoxy. This isn't, this isn't about that. It's, it's about relationship. Because at some point, if I've worked on my relationship with God, if I am mature in, 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 my, uh, in my, my walk with Jesus Christ, then I can help someone who is less mature with their walk with Jesus Christ without being self-righteous and without being critical. I can establish a relationship with them in the depth of my own relationship with Jesus Christ. Does that make sense to you? No? For, for those of you who are watching, um, uh, everybody's going to go, go on now. We have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> it's about relationships. The whole of the Sermon on the Mount is about that relationship. And this specifically is about our relationship with, other, with, with each other. Certainly we can stand on doctrine. Certainly uh, we, can, we, can have, uh, we can say that there are moral, moral rights and moral wrongs. Certainly we can say that there is sin. But we cannot stand in a critical self-righteous judgment because true judgment, again, going back to the translation, the, the true judgment only belongs to God. Atos. We can say that there are right things. We can say that there are wrong things. We can say that the Bible clearly states that there are, there are things that with sins that we have to avoid and things that we can't do. But before we are critical of one another, we have to look at our own. A good friend of mine who is an alcoholic, um, the boy can't have another drink the rest of his life. If he does, I won't see him for six months, nobody will see him for six months, and, and somewhere we'll pick him up out of the gutter somewhere, somehow. He knows it. He knows that's his problem. Brothers and sisters, I don't have that problem. However, I got my own. Okay? So, when my friend calls me and he talks about, he talks about alcohol or he talks about what, he's, what he thinks he wants to do this weekend, guess what I can get, gently do? I can remind him about who Jesus Christ is in his life. But see, then I can call him up and say, Brother, I'm having this real problem in my own life. And he knows it. And he can gently re remind me, this is what Jesus has brought you out of. See how that works? It's talking about relationship both with God and with one another as believers. But, but Jesus also begins to talk about, about another kind of relationship. And it is the relationship that we have with, with the secular world. Sometimes these verses uh, seem disjointed because you have that, uh, uh, you have that idea of, of don't be a hypocrite and first take the log out of your own eye and then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. And then you have this, this whole different section that says do not give what is holy to dogs and not throw your pearls before swine they will be tramp or, be or they will trample them underfoot and turn and maul you. It seems disjointed, but it is, in reality, the way that Christians need to deal with, not only with each other, but with the secular world and the non-believer. I was watching this show the other night. In fact, it made my, my daughter sick to her stomach. <laughs> it's called Fatal Attractions. It's on the Animal, Chan Animal Planet channel or whatever. And, and there, was this, there was this story about this guy who lived with these lizards. And, and, and other people who, who uh, lived with, with, with uh, poisonous snakes and stuff like that, and how these animals actually killed their, the people that were, that were watching over them. And, and the, 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 the problem was that, that the people who were, who were taking care of these animals, these deadly animals, they forgot that these animals could kill them. And they eventually did. 
Jesus is harsh in his, in, his, uh, in his statement here. Do not give what is holy to dogs. Do not throw your pearls before swine. Or they will trample them underfoot and turn and maul you. It's har harsh language. But Jesus is using this language to make a point. There, there were in Palestine wild dogs. And these wild dogs were just that. They were, they were wild animals. And if you, it, 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 they would, they would uh, in, in search of food, they would maul people. In the, in the Jewish tradition, pigs are unclean. Pigs are, are, are not, to be, not to be dealt with, not to be eaten, not to be around. And Jesus uses this harsh language because he is, he is uh, making it clear the difference between Christianity and those who don't believe in Jesus Christ. And that there, there, is, there is a danger for us. What happens when we allow the secular to inform the holy? What happens when we allow the, the secular to inform the church? The gospel and what Jesus teaches is foreign to the world. Now, here's why, how, how I want to explain this to you. Uh, in, in Jesus was crucified on a cross. In, in, in that uh, time period, the cross was something that was feared. The cross, even for, especially for the Jew, was something that was, that was utter defilement. It was an utter curse to be hung from a tree. Here is the cross that is, that is a horrible way to die. It is a horrible punishment. For anybody that would see a cross, it meant death. It meant destruction. It meant pain. It meant suffering. It meant curse. It meant the very worst of anything that could happen. What does the cross mean to us today? Really, what does the cross mean to us today? When I see a cross and I think about Jesus Christ, what do I think about? I think about love and I think about mercy and, and I think about, uh, I think about uh, 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 eternal life, not death. It makes no sense, does it? That we can take this symbol that used to mean death and destruction and all of those things, and now that symbol for us means love and life and, and mercy and all of those things. A God that is gracious. How could that be? It makes no sense. And that is the way that the gospel makes no sense for people who don't believe in the gospel. John Wesley, thinking and preaching to the growing group of people called Mesley, uh, called Mesleys, called Methodists. <laughs> I can delete that. Um, he saw that they had become richer and more, influ and more influenced by society, more influential in society. And as a result, he noted that their faith was in danger. He feared that the people called Methodists would allow too much of this secular world into their faith. And then he said that he feared that they would become a dead sect with only a form of religion. I watched this latest general conference. I don't know if you if you if you know this. Uh, uh, the United Methodist uh, Church has general conference every four years, every quadrennium, and and uh, uh, we just had our, our general con uh, general conference. And I watched a lady stand in the midst of all the arguments because there was there was a proposal for restructuring and, and how money would be dealt with and, and, and how agencies would be funded and this was a this was a, 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 a an argument a horrible debacle and one woman stood up in the midst of all these all these uh, arguments and all the stuff that was going on in 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 arguing about how money and structure was going to be used in the face of a steep decline in membership in the United Methodist Church. And she said, "I have one question." And everybody everybody was silent. She stood at the microphone and she said, "When did we acquire a gospel of scarcity instead of a gospel of abundance?" When we allow the secular to inform the holy is when we acquire a gospel of scarcity. When somehow we get to the point that human systems and minds can save or inform the church better than God can, Christianity gets mauled and the gospel trampled. I remember somebody once told me that I needed to be the CEO of the church. 
And I should rely on a catchy slogan, open doors, open minds. Wait, how does it go? Open something, open doors, open minds. Let me tell you why I can't remember that. I can't remember it because I thought we already had a slogan. I thought we already had the slogan that said, Christ was dead, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. I thought that was our slogan. My bad. If we focus on Jesus Christ and building our relationships with Him and helping one another instead of being critical with one another, then there is something that is incredible that happens if we don't let the secular inform the church. And Jesus goes on to tell us what that incredible thing is. I'm going to go past 10 o'clock. I apologize. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to do it anyway. Because there is a fruit in our relationship. A fruit of fulfilled desire. I changed my major in seminary and I wrestled, I wrestled with that change for, for a long time. I, I struggled with, with this change because it, it, it was going to mean a, a very different path for me and, and, and for my family. I talked to, a, to a, a, one of my professors, uh, Dr. Dale Hale. He took me aside on a few different occasions and we talked, about, we talked about the desire of one's heart. And this scripture was, was something that we talked about several times. You see, as we work out our relationship with God, God begins to show us the meaning of the desires that He has placed in our hearts. Sometimes we call it conviction. Sometimes we call it calling. Sometimes even perhaps we might call it conscience. But this section of Scripture is connected to the ones that we've already read. Sometimes this section of Scripture is connected with, with a, a prosperity gospel. Indeed, many are broken by this when they are asked over and over for what they want and their prayers uh, seem to go unanswered. Oh God, give me this and give me that. You say that you're going to give me whatever I ask for whenever I knock. You're going to do all this stuff. And, and so give me this and give me that. But this, this section isn't about asking, seeking, and knocking with the intent of, of getting what I want. This, this uh, section is about asking and seeking and knocking with the intent of finding, defining, and living out the desire that God has given you to serve Him. Think about this. Jesus uses these metaphors, you know, that, that you wouldn't give uh, uh, that your child asked for bread, you wouldn't give your child a stone. If your child asked for a fish, you wouldn't give your child a snake. Jesus is, is telling us in this scripture that God has placed a calling in each one of our lives. And, and that calling is, is the desire of our heart. And this is what Dr. Dale Hale was telling me. He was saying, there is a desire. Think about the desires that God has placed in your heart. And then you pray. And then you ask God. And then you seek and He will give you answers. He, you ask and he will, he will give you what you need to know. You you knock and He will open the doors for your calling, for the desire that He has placed in your heart. Church, ask for the desire that God has placed in your hearts. Ask, seek for the wisdom to follow the, the desires that God has placed in your hearts. Not the desires that you have for yourselves. God's desire for you and your calling. And knock and the door will be open. Amen? This is the fruit of this relationship as you see it. As, it. as it unfolds, Jesus is telling us how to have a relationship with Him. How to have a relationship with, with each other. How to not allow the secular world to influence that holy relationship that we have. And once we, once we grow in that relationship, we find the desires of our hearts. And we ask, and God gives. And we seek, and God shows us where to find. And we knock, and the doors are broken down. This is Jesus' sermon to the people that hear it. Finally, in everything you do, do to others as you would have them do to you. For this is the law and the prophets. When you do that, then you can ask. Then you can seek. Then you can knock.